Hello, I'm Denise Campbell Bauer, United States Ambassador to the Kingdom of Belgium. I'm delighted to introduce this video celebrating the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Ghent. The Treaty of Ghent ended the War of 1812 and began the special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom. The strong ties between Belgium and the United States predate the founding of both our nations. Ghent's role in hosting the negotiations strengthened the friendship between the United States of America and what would become the Kingdom of Belgium. Officially, the U.S.-Belgian relationship began in 1832, when the United States was one of the first countries to recognize Belgium's independence. Our bilateral relationship was cemented by shared sacrifices in World War I and World War II and is focused today on growing our economies and addressing international challenges. We hope you enjoy this video celebrating the birth of these important transatlantic relationships. April 28, 1814. A courier had this morning arrived from the Emperor with the news that Napoleon Bonaparte, on having the decree of the French Senate notified to him, declaring that he was cashiered, had immediately abdicated the throne, and thus the war is at an end. With this prospect of a general peace in Europe, I commenced my journey to contribute, if possible, to the restoration of peace to my own country. fact that in uh, February of this year, 1814, the French administration and the French troops left Ghent after 20 years of uh, French presence here in Ghent. It was at this moment the end of the era of Napoleon and the streets of Ghent at this moment were colored by uh, troops. You have to understand that the War of 1812 was a continuation of bad relations between the United States and Great Britain that started with our Revolutionary War 25 years earlier, 30 years earlier. And um, really our entire history at that point diplomatically, as I studied diplomacy, was based on a very simple phrase, bad with Britain. What happened uh, in America since the beginning of the independence in 1776 uh, was of highly interest for what happened in Europe. June 24, 1814, St. John's Day, and the day of our arrival at Ghent. We came through St. Nicholas and Lokeren to Ghent, where we arrived at four in the afternoon and took lodgings at the Hotel de Peba on the Place d'Arm. The distance from Antwerp here is six and a half post, about 30 English miles. The road, a perfect level and well paved. The country, a continual garden. When you look at the composition of the two delegations, then the American delegation was very high level. It was an amazing delegation. And to understand the delegation, it's important to understand how important the War of 1812 was for the United States. Uh, for the United States, that war was an existential war. If we lost that war, we may have lost our independence. A part of the English delegation was dressed in a military uniform. I think uh, nobody of the American delegation was dressed in a military uniform. They were um, citizens. Uh, high-class citizens. July 9, 1814. The American ministers had this day meeting in my chamber from 12 o'clock noon until 4. All the members were present, and we had a general conversation upon a variety of objects relating to our own situation here and to our present mission. I proposed the question whether we should make an official communication to the British government of our being here, waiting for their commissioners. This was not agreed to. But it was determined that a letter to our own government should be written 
to inform the Secretary of State that we are here and transmit copies of the correspondence relating to the removal of the seat of negotiation from Gothenburg to Ghent. They chose Ghent because of the location. It's, it's, it was easy to get in, in, in London, but also because Ghent was important enough and had the infrastructure to have important people here. Ghent was a city with a fast growing population, with a big network of uh, societies, recreational societies, uh, uh, learn societies. Americans arrived here, they were very welcomed by a lot of important families. One of the families was Dana Steenhuis and we have uh, the opportunity here to be here today. It is a wonderful house, 18th century house, in this wonderful Chinese room. It was indeed a win-win situation for uh, Dana Steenhuis who had to reinforce his own new position as intendant of uh, the old province called Département. Ghent still is an important place and the region of Ghent is an important place for flowers uh, and the actual floralian, floralies, uh, the Royal Society of uh, Botanics, um, was, an, was an important uh, association then and they also organized an exhibition after the signing of the treaty and they uh, named for every member of the delegation a flower and the most beautiful flower became the Treaty of Ghent flower. October 12, 1814. I made a draft of an answer to the last note from the British plenipotentiaries, but had not finished it when the time of our meeting came. At the meeting, Mr. Gallatin produced his draft and read parts of mine. They differed much in the tone of the composition. The tone of all the British notes is arrogant, overbearing, and offensive. The tone of ours is neither so bold nor so spirited as I think it should be. It is too much on the defensive and too excessive in the caution to say nothing irritating. Negotiations uh, often play on psychological states, especially in those days. For the American delegation, it took them sometimes two months to get instructions from Washington. So they really were on their own in many ways. The American delegation arrived on June 24th, but the British delegation waited and waited, even though they could come easily at any time. And the reason they were doing that was because they hoped that the war would go in their favor. September 20, 1814. We so fondly cling to the vain hope of peace that every new proof of its impossibility operates upon us as a disappointment. They had to put every man they could in the field, even arming the president to fight against the British uh, because we thought we were on the verge of losing. Had we lost Baltimore, uh, the Battle of Baltimore, we would have been in a position where our negotiators could not have negotiated uh, a fair deal for the United States, and we might even have lost our independence. You, you can see it in, in the newspapers and, and, and the books in the library of the Société des Gants, uh, how high the interest was for what happened in that new young country. It was not only a young country, it was a completely different country in the United States of America. The constitutional power was something completely new, very interesting for uh, a new political class. Uh, the national anthem was written by Francis Scott Key as he watched the battle in Baltimore Harbor. And uh, when he saw uh, what he called the Star Spangled Banner in the morning, what he really meant was that in seeing that flag, he knew the country had survived. When that news reached our delegation, our delegation was in a much better position to negotiate with the British. The British thought that by waiting they'd be stronger, but it didn't turn out that way. August 9, 1814. He stated that this proposition to give them a distinct boundary 
different from the boundary already existing, and by a treaty between the United States and Great Britain, was not only new, it was unexampled. No such treaty had been made by Great Britain either before or since the American Revolution, and no such treaty had to his knowledge ever been made by any other European power. And unfortunately, it took very long before letters arrived. So I think it must have been very hard to live here for such a long time, far from his wife who was in St. Petersburg, far from his children who were left in the United States with his parents. Um, yes, that must have been very, very hard. And that lack of communication had also terrible consequences because probably, as you know, after the signing of the treaty, the war still continued and in New Orleans, the, the famous Battle of New Orleans happens after the signing of the treaty. December 24, 1814, we went to their house, the house of the British. And after settling the protocol of yesterday's conference, Mr. Baker read one of the British copies of the treaty. Mr. Gallatin and myself had the two other copies before us, comparing them as he read. The six copies were signed and sealed by the three British and the five American plenipotentiaries. Lord Gambier delivered the three British copies, and I delivered to him the three American copies of the treaty, which he said he hoped would be permanent. I told him I hoped it would be the last treaty of peace between Great Britain and the United States. I really love this treaty because it is such an important part of American history. If I were trying to explain to Americans why they should care about the Treaty of Ghent, I'd say, you know, you know about Lexington and Concord, you know about the Liberty Bell, but it turns out that part of our founding, part of what made the United States what it is, happened right here in Ghent. You can only speak about history when you write it and when you tell it. I think that if you look at this treaty, the Treaty of Ghent, and this kind of balance and lack of retribution, it prefigured the approach that was taken in the Congress of Vienna in 1815, which established 99 years of peace in Europe. So I think it's really a great model of moderation and diplomacy. It's a great model of an open, kind of open-hearted diplomacy. And it's a model that really has produced a unique peace there really are no closer nations in the world than the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. It's a unique peace that's lasted 200 years, and it's extremely strong right now. It's stronger than it's ever been.